starting. Thinking and being supported. All right. Did you guys hear that? Just raise your hand. OK, perfect. So thank you. So all right, let's start with today's lecture. I assume you can see my slides. When I ask you a question, please raise, raise your hands just so I know that most, my questions will mostly be restricted to yes, no questions. Can you see my mouse? Can, okay, perfect, good. So uh, today's lecture, it's going to be a relatively easy lecture. It's going to be on representations. The, uh, so far, we've seen what a neural network is and how you can make it learn to perform specific tasks like classifying static patterns or scanning for patterns or analyzing time series and converting one set, one type of sequence to another. But in the process, the network actually computes a lot of intermediate values in the uh, within the network. So what exactly do these inter intermediate values mean? What do they represent? That is going to be the focus of today's lecture. And we will, we will use this lecture as a basis for our lecture on variational autoencoders. That is going to happen maybe four classes from now. So here's what we have seen so far. Uh, here's how you train a network. You want the network to learn some function. You give it a collection of input-output pairs, uh, which are represented by these lines. And you sort of learn the parameters of the network to compute the correct, as, as closely, correct, compute as closely as possible, the, the correct output value for each input value in this training set. And the hope is that uh, when you do so, the uh, network will learn to predict the output values at these, at these training data, and in the process, learn the function over the entire space. So uh, now this is how it's supposed to work, right? By the way, if you have any questions, raise your hands. So here's what uh, you expect would happen. If you were given, for example, a classification task with training data of this kind, where in this particular example, you have data from two classes, the red data points represent one class, the blue data points represent the other class. You'd expect the network to learn all of these decision boundaries, to basically learn the boundaries of all of both of these pentagons. Now, so in effect, you want it to learn a function like this figure to the right, where the function value is one within the two pentagons and zero outside. Now, in reality, this is not the kind of data you're actually going to get you're going to get, most often, you're going to get data of this kind, where you won't have the data nicely, cleanly separated into red and blue regions. They're going to have some blue data in the red regions, some red data in the blue regions. And so the actual function, if you were to visualize it, that, that uh, segregates the red and blue data is going to look something like this figure to the right, which is kind of fuzzy. There are regions where you can't be certain that the output is red or that it's blue, but there's some degree of fuzziness, right? Now, when you have data of this kind, what exactly is the function we will learn? What will the network learn? So to understand this, I'm going to sort of go take two steps backward and keep producing the, uh, uh, look at simple, simpler versions in lower dimensions. So consider, uh, data in two, dim two dimensions. Consider this two-dimensional example. So here the red and green dots are two different classes. Now these two classes here are approximately linearly separable. So intuitively, uh, the kind of function you would want to learn for data of this kind is the step function shown to the right, where on the blue side, where, where data that, are, that lie on the floor on the left-hand side would be classified as blue, class zero data which lie on the right-hand side on the raised portion of the step would be classified as red, which is class one. Now, the problem is that these data are not separated. So you, amongst the training data, you have some blue dots on the floor on the red side and some red dots hanging in the air on the blue side. So in this case, uh, how exactly, clearly this is not a situation where a nice clean boundary can be drawn. So what will the function learn? Now, again, 
Uh, it's not immediately apparent from this figure, so it makes sense to take a step back into an even simpler example to see what exactly could happen and what intuitively makes sense. So in a one dimensional case, I'm gonna take a step back and lower the dimensionality of the data for illustration. So assume your data are all unidimensional, just one input, uh, one, one uh, feature, right? So then your training data could have, uh, could be something like this, where all the blue dots which lie on the axis represent data from the zero class, all the red dots represent data from the one class. And so anytime you encounter a data point from the blue class, you want the output of the network to be zero. Whenever you encounter the data from the red class, you want the output to be one. And clearly these data are not linearly separable. Now they're not separable in any uh, simple manner. Now also intuitively you can see that as you go further left, the number of red points keeps decreasing till eventually you stop seeing red dots. As you keep going to the right, the number of blue dots keeps decreasing till eventually you stop seeing blue dots. And so you would expect that the that a most reasonable classifier over here is going to be a linear classifier, which is simply a threshold function for one dimensional data. The, uh, you, you would place a threshold at some point and say uh, any data to the right of the threshold is, is going to be classified as one. Anything to the left is going to be classified as zero. And the real issue becomes where do you place the threshold to minimize the kind of errors that you will make. But then if you trained a neural network with such data, now a neural network as we know is extremely flexible and can learn pretty much any ugly function. So in that case, there's nothing really stopping the neural network from learning this completely hideous function which keeps jumping up and down between zeros and ones, but captures the training data perfectly. This is what you guys have been calling overfitting, right? So uh, although the, the, the separator that would make, that makes more sense over here is a, uh, is, uh, is a threshold, if you just sort of naively provided uh, this data to your neural network, there's nothing stopping the network from learning a function of this kind, right? So, but I, you know, and this is clearly not a satisfactory answer, but even here, even an infinitely flexible neural network, let's assume now, now uh, the point is, there's no God-given truth. I'm speaking of intuition over here, right? I'm saying intuitively, you would expect that the optimal classifier to be a threshold. That doesn't have to be the case. So maybe you maybe you might feel that you know it's it's a satisfactory uh, thing to be doing to learn a function of this kind, but then let's go to an even more extreme example to see why that is not so. Consider the the situation where I have a large number of data points which have exactly the same x value, but some of them have y value zero and others have y value one. So at this point there are more than two data instances. There are in fact many data instances. Some of them lie on the, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, axis and have y equals zero. Some of them lie up here and have y equals one. Now in this case, what would you want the network to produce, right? Because there is no unique answer. So you have two possible choices. You can say, let's say uh, you have a hundred training instances at this point and 90 of them have the value one and 10 of them have the value zero. Then you have two choices. One is to say, because the majority is red, I'm going to make the network, I want the network to produce a one. Does that make sense? Or do you want a more informative answer? Like I want to say at this point, 90% 0.9 or the, a fraction, 0.9 fraction of all data points take the value one. So that, so, in one case, you'd want the output to be one. In the other, you want the output to be 0.9. And clearly 0.9 is the more reasonable answer because it is, it is much more informative, right? Now, what exactly is this 0.9? This 0.9 is really an estimate of the a posteriori probability of the class one given the input X. 
and this is the and this is uh, potentially much more useful than a simple one zero decision because uh, it's uh, telling you something about that value and also it's potentially more realistic in most real world scenarios this softer information is going to be uh, more useful for downstream computations but then let me change the situation so here sort of i think most of you will agree that having an output of 0.9 makes sense right but then let me change the change the situation just a little bit i'm going to nudge some of the nine the, all of the points a teeny weeny amount like by say 10 raised to minus 17 right the limit of your floating point some of them will move left some of them move right will, will move right then just because you nudge the data points a little bit does it mean it's now okay to go back and learn a function which is swinging wildly back between zero and one obviously not right that that noise is really very small and even in that situation even though all of the points don't exactly line up at that x you still have, you still would sort of believe that the best uh, answer you should get at this point is going to be the posterior probability of one given x but then here there are two points problems right first at no single point do you have more than if if i nudge all of these points a tiny bit just an infinite infinitesimal bit you can end up with a situation where at no single point you have more than one training instance because they're all perturbed yet at each point what you really want is the some reasonable guess of the a posteriori probability of the class one given the input x so how do we estimate this in this in this uh, in this uh, situation so let's go back and look at this slightly differently at each point instead of just looking at the data as we swing left to right uh, at each data instance at the location of each data instance instead of just looking at that one data instance we will look at a small window in x around that point and within that window in x you're going to see other data instances and some of them will have a class value zero others will have a class value one and what we will do is to plot the average y value of all of the instances within this window so here for example if you consider the data instance here the average of all y values within this range is clearly just zero but then as i keep going from left to right through the data instances you will find initially the average remains zero and then eventually you'll begin encountering data instances which have the value one and so the average will begin moving up from zero and then as you keep moving right eventually you get a get to a point where there are no more blue there, there, there are no more data instances from class zero and so now the average is going to saturate at the value one and the over and this sequence of blue dots gives you an estimate of of the a posteriori probability of the class one given x at each point if you connect them all up you're going to get a curve of this kind and this curve which is a very familiar sigmoidal curve gives you the a posteriori probability of one given x and clearly uh, this is what you really want to learn because this gives you this this tells you something something much more realistic about the underlying nature of the world and again that 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 actually becomes most obvious if you consider the situation where you have a whole collection of data points within uh, an infinitesimal perturbation of one another obviously they're trying to follow each data each data instance doesn't make sense this kind of average is what what makes the most sense so this is what you'd want, expect reasonably your network to learn now that function the shape of this function is really well modeled by the logistic function we've seen this in class the logistic function has this shape given by this equation on top which i'm circling with my mouse so it is one over one plus e raised to minus of w0 plus w1x again you can see that as x becomes if w0 and w1 are both positive or you know even ignoring w0 if w1 is positive you can see that as x becomes more and more negative 
then W1X is going to become a large negative number, E raised to, uh, wait, is that what I'm gonna get? Yeah, so minus of W1X is going to become a large positive number. And so E raised to a large positive number is going to be infinity. So one divided by infinity is going to become zero. So P of Y equals one, the a posteriori probability of class one given X, as X becomes increasingly negative, is quickly going to go to zero. On the other hand, if x becomes very positive, then w1x is going to be a large positive number. You have the minus outside. So you're going to have e raised to minus of a large positive number. This will become zero. And so as x becomes large, this term goes to zero and the a posteriori probability of one given x will saturate at one. So this function has this nice property, which is exactly the kind of uh, structure you want that as you go from one side to the other, the a posteriori probability of class one goes smoothly from zero to one. And so this is in fact what we use as our logistic perceptron and the uh, final output layer of your classifier. Typically, it's a sigmoid perceptron. And when you have just a single input, it models the a posteriori probability of the class given the single input. But even if you have more than one input, the same thing holds. So consider this two-dimensional example. Again, this is the same figure that we saw earlier. Uh, what you really want is some kind, the, the uh, ideal decision uh, function is going to be the step function, which classifies everything to the right as red and everything to the left as, uh, as, as class one and everything to the left of this boundary as class zero. But that's kind of a hard threshold, right? Because there's no line, there's no hyperplane that clearly separates the two colors. What makes more sense, even in this scenario, is a function of this kind, which sort of smoothly goes from zero and, and sort of slopes up and becomes one. Again, the decision boundary here is linear. So you want this function to look like a folded sheet where the fold, the, the where the fold aligns up with 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 uh, the structure of the data. So if you assume that actually that the hard function that you'd want to estimate, which makes the lowest errors, is something like the step function, then you'd expect this the, expect uh, this fold to somehow approximate the step function. Now, and this is in fact what your logistic regression, your your uh, uh, sigmoidal function on two inputs would compute. If you plotted this function, this is going with this. This is the sigmoidal function on two inputs, or in fact any number of inputs. It's going to model this sort, this curving sheet, and this curving sheet is actually an approximation to the step function. But although the sheet itself is not linear, it actually represents a linear decision boundary. So, for example, if you decide on some threshold and you say that uh, if the a posteriori probability of class one is greater than 0.5. I'm going to call it class one. If it's less than 0.5, I'm going to call it class zero. And then mark the location on the, uh, on the X plane where the a posteriori probability is exactly equal to 0.5. You will find that that locus is an exact line. So regardless of the threshold, the, the, the locus of all the points at which this a posteriori probability takes uh, that specific exact threshold is always going to be a line. So the, uh, uh, classification boundaries modeled by this logistic are actually linear. This represents a linear classifier. So once again, the point here is that uh, when you have data of this kind, what you really want to learn is a function of this nature. And that is in fact what is learned by your logistic function. So fine. But then how do you actually estimate this function? To estimate this function, let's, let's go back and look at uh, the uh, kind of data we would provide to estimate the function. You'd give it a large collection of training data, many x, y pairs, where within each pair, you're going to have an x coordinate and the corresponding label, which is going to be either zero or one. And to learn, the, learn this function, learning this function is basically the same as learning the parameters of this function, namely w0 and w1. So to learn this function, we want to estimate the W0 and W1 that best approximate this curve, which best captures the a posteriori probability of class one given the input. 
Now, to, mod to, to learn it, I'm going to look at two functions. One is the a posteriori probability of class one, given the input, that's p of y equals one given the input, and that's the familiar logistic function. The other is the a posteriori probability of the other class. Now, so far I've been speaking of class zero and class one, but for mathematical convenience, I'm going to clock all the other class, class minus one. So this other curve represents the a posteriori probability of class minus one given x. And clearly the probability of minus one given x is simply going to be one minus the probability of one given x because there are only two classes. And if you work that out, that's simply going to come as uh, this function over here, which is one over one plus e raised to w zero plus w one x. So observe that the a posteriori probability for class one is one over one plus e raised to minus w zero plus w one x. The a posteriori probability for class minus one is one over one plus e raised to plus w zero plus w one x. So these two can, can uh, you, you can easily see that I can combine these two guys into one function, which is given below, which is that p of y given x equals one over one plus e raised to minus of y times w0 plus w1x. You can see that when y is one, this equation, this yellow equation collapses to the equation to the left. And when y is minus one, this equation over here simply becomes the equation to the right. So this is a common way of representing both these curves. You choose the y and you get the corresponding curve, right? So this is function now gives you the a posteriori probability of the label given x for, for, for all labels. And now we can use that to learn the parameters of the model. We are given a collection of training data, which are x, x y pairs, where I'm, I'm sort of, although here I've drawn this using scalars, I'm going to generalize this to vectors. Uh, this, uh, so I'm going to assume that the x's are vectors. The y's are binary. Actually, this should be minus one and plus one class values, right? The total probability, yeah. and the total probability of the data, assuming all of these training instances are independent, is going to be the joint probability of all of the training instances, which, because they're all independent, is simply the product over all training instances of the probability of each uh, x, y pair. Now the probability of any x, y combination is using Bayes rule is simply going to be the prob a, a priori probability of x times the probability of y given x. So this term over here, p of y given x times p of x is the joint probability of x and y. I multiply that over all training instances and this term over here, which I'm circling with my mouse, is the joint probability of all of my training instances. Now, our model, if I'm using the logistic model, assumes that p of y given x is given by this logistic function over here, which is one over one plus e raised to minus y times w zero plus w one transpose x. There's, a, there's some notational errors here, I'll fix them, okay? So now, so here again is the complete probability of the training data. This complete probability has, is, is a multiplication of many terms, which is kind of ugly. So I can take the logarithm and the logarithm of the probability of the training data is going to be just the log of this term to the right. This summation is going to become a sum over all training instances. I have a product of two terms over here. I can separate them out. So the P of X i is simply going to give you the log of p of x i over here and the and this term which is the p of y given x when i take the log of it it's simply going to give you the negative of the log of the denominator so overall or the the logarithm of the probability of the training data is given by this formula down here which is a summation over all training instances of the log of the probability of the training instance minus the summation over all training instances of the log of the denominator of this logistic term, which is one plus e raised to minus y times w zero plus w transpose x. Now, if you're using your standard statistical training models, and if you wanted to learn 
the, the, the parameters of this model that best explain the data, then you would learn W0 and W to maximize this log probability. And when you, and of course, this first term doesn't really depend on W, so this can be completely ignored. So if you were trying to statistically learn uh, the parameters of this model, you just try to maximize this minus summation log of one plus e raised to minus y, w, w0 plus, plus w transpose x. So that would be your maximum likelihood training estimate. Your estimate for w0 and w1 is simply going to be the set of w0 and w1 that maximize the log probability of your training data, which is going to be which is going to maximize minus of summation over i log of one plus e raised to minus y w zero plus w one transpose x. Now maximizing a negative term is the same as minimizing the term itself. So if I get rid of this minus over here, that is going to be the same as minimizing this summation term, which is summation i log of this argument. So this maximum likelihood estimate, which is given on the top, is the same as this as this minimization estimate, which is argument w0 plus w1, w0 w1 of summation i log of 1 plus e raised to minus y w0 plus w transpose x. So this term, this log, you will recognize it. So this log up over here, this term over here is in fact simply the cross entropy between a one hot representation of the label and the output of the output of the logistic function. So it turns out that performing maximum likelihood estimation is exactly the same as minimizing the cross entropy, the callback labeler divergence or the cross entropy loss between the desired output of the, of the logistic and the actual output of the logistic. This can't be solved directly, it needs gradient descent, but you get the idea. When you simply use gradient descent to train the logistic function, what you're really doing is uh, com coming up with a maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters of the logistic function. Now we will see how this ties in with neural networks in a bit, okay? So we've looked at a linear classifier. The problems we saw over here in these earlier figures, all of these assume that the classes were separable by uh, or most uh, most intuitively and most cleanly separated by a linear decision boundary. But then what happens when you have a, a problem of this kind where the decision boundaries are not linear here, the ideal decision boundaries are going to look like this double pentagon. This is a non-linear classifier. So what would happen in this situation? Now to understand this, I'm again using the same theme that we've been following. I'm going to sort of simplify the problem a bit first. Let's consider the separable case. In the separable case, your red and blue data don't overlap. So you're going to have data cleanly of this kind. And from these data, what you would want to learn are the boundaries of these double pentagons. So you want to learn a function like this figure on the right. And now we know exactly what kind of neural network can model this function. So here is the network. We've seen this in lecture two. Uh, the, uh, you would need one subnetwork for the lower pentagon, which is given by this figure to the left with five uh, neurons capturing the five boundaries. And this uh, second, first second level neuron, which combines these for five boundaries to give you the lower pentagon. Then you have the subnet to the right where these five neurons capture the five boundaries of the upper pentagon and this upper neuron combines them to give you the pentagon itself. And then you finally have this neuron on the top which combines ors both of these pentagons. So this network to the right is a sufficient pentagon, a sufficient network. And this, this network would work even with, even with threshold activations. You don't even need sigmoid activations because the classes are linearly separable, right? But then here is the situation. This final pers neuron over here, this is a perceptron. Regardless of whether you're using a logistic uh, activation or a threshold activation, it is actually a linear classifier. 
it actually captures linear decision boundaries. So if this perceptron is able to perfectly classify the red dots from the blue dots, what does that tell us? What does that tell us about the features that came out of these two neurons? Clearly, this guy is only operating on the space of features output by these two neurons. And this guy on top can only perform linear classification. So that means that by the time all of this data is processed by the lower network, and you get these two features Y1 and Y2, in the Y1, Y2 space, the data must be linearly separable. Otherwise, this neuron on top cannot separate the blue and the red, and you would not get perfect classification. So here is this uh, really interesting situation. The actual data are not separate, separated linearly, but then by the time the, but then as the data pass through the network, the data keep getting, each layer of the network produces some features computed from the data. And by the time you get to this penultimate layer, the features that have been extracted from the data are now linearly separable. So you can think of this lower portion of the network as a transformation that transforms these non-linearly separable classes to linearly separable features. And the upper, upper neuron itself is the linear classifier that operates on these linearly separable features and separates them. And once you see them in this manner, then you can then it, then it's easy for you to realize that at this point, if you from this perspective, you could basically you could, could basically uh, use any linear classifier at this point. It could be a logistic regression. If the classes are linearly separable, uh, you could use any other kind of uh, all that would be really hard. Uh, you could you could use, for instance, uh, perceptron classification rule, assuming that the uh, lower portion of the network has already been computed, or even an SVM over here. Basically, all we know is that if this lower portion of the network does its job, y1, y, in the y1, y2 space, the classes are going to be linearly separable, and the, and the uh, neuron on top can be any linear classifier. Now, of course, we are jointly optimized when we actually train the network. We jointly optimize both blocks of the network. So as you are simultaneously learning to extract linearly separable features from the data and to perform classification on these linearly separable features. Now, this was for a sufficient, barely sufficient network, right? But it's not, this is not specific to barely sufficient networks. This would apply for any network. If you have any network of whatever complexity, which perfectly classifies the training data, what this means is that by the time the data have arrived at this final neuron, which performs the classification, the data have become linearly separable. And if the, on the other hand, so long as this network is sufficient, has sufficient capacity to actually learn this decision boundary. On the other hand, if this network has uh, insufficient capacity, there are too few neurons or the architecture is insufficient and we, saw, and we saw how this can happen in lecture two. In that case, what would happen? In this case, the network uh, would not be able to extract features that are linearly separable. And so then the classifier is not going to be able to learn to uh, classify the, uh, separate the classes exactly. But nevertheless, the network is going to try to attempt to transform the features into a, into a space where they are as, in, they transform the inputs into a space where they are as linearly separable as possible, such that the final classifier makes the fewest errors. So mathematically, if you have a function, I can, I can uh, uh, separate this entire network into two parts. The first is the slower portion, which is some f of x, which com computes the features y, and the upper one, which is in our case, a logistic function, which operates on the feature y. So y out is simply going to be the logistic function applied on the features y, where the features y themselves are computed by the lower portion of the network, f of x, which compute these separable or almost separable functions of the input. So 
the network until the second to last layer is basically a nonlinear function f of x that converts the input space of x into the feature space y where the classes are maximally linearly separable. Questions? Any questions so far? None, I guess. So here's the story so far. A classification MLP actually consists of two components. The first is a feature extraction network that converts the input into linearly separable features or nearly linearly separable features and a final linear classifier that operates on the linearly separable features. Now, but then, uh, what exactly do these lower layers do? How do they respond? Now, observe that what we've seen so far are these other networks, is a is network all the way until the penultimate layer, but there are also layers below the penultimate layer, right? So if I go one layer below the penultimate layer, this portion of the network, what does this compute, right? What we know is this, that whatever this portion of the network computes is the input that the next layer operates on to generate linearly separable features. So in some sense, these, the, the immediately lower portion of the network generates data that make, the, make it easy for the next layer to make them linearly separable. And as you keep going lower and lower, lower into, down the network, in, when I draw the network from bottom to top, as you get closer to the input, you're going to find the data, the data are less and less linearly separable, but then each layer in the network makes the day classes increasingly linearly separable until finally when this when the entire feature extraction has been computed they're as linearly separable as possible so this is the manifold hypothesis which assumes that in the input space the classes are actually uh, linearly separable on some non-linear manifold basically the data lie on some curved surface and if you could flatten that surface out then the data would all be linearly separable. The reason they are not linearly separable in the original space is that that surface has been crumpled into some ugly shape. And that, and that as you go through the network from bottom to top, each layer sequentially straightens out this manifold until you get to the top where at this point now that the manifold has been straightened out enough that all the classes become linearly separable. So uh, to see that this is in fact a very valid a hypothesis, we have some examples over here. So this is example is, an ex is a synthetic example of two classes. Uh, here are the data. The two classes are linearly separable, are separable but not linearly so. Uh, and this is the figure is not to scale, but I have a circle within which all the data are a class one. And then outside the circle, all the data are class zero. And clearly, in this input space, the data are not linearly separable. Now I'm going to process this using a two, three, one neural network, which is to say the input is two dimensional, but then I have one hidden layer with three neurons, and then uh, the output is a single neuron because it's a, it's a, it's a two layer classifier. Now remember, remember how the computation is performed. So at the output of the, at the uh, first step in, process, in, in the processing is to compute an affine combination of the inputs. So the affine combination, because the hidden layer has got three neurons, the affine combination is going to take this input and sort of suspend it, rotate it and, 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 and shift it and put this plane in some three dimensional space. Then we apply the activation on this, on this plane and the activation in which here in this figure, it's a tan H activation. That's going to sort of distort the plane. And then once you distort the plane, the next layer, because it's a three, two, three, one network, that's going to sort of the, uh, in the next layer, first you combine, compute an affine combination of the three dimensional inputs from this, from, from the outputs of the first layer. That affine combination is now a scalar, it's just going to put things on a single surface. And then finally you have the, uh, you have the actual logistic, which is going to compute a decision boundary. It's going to compute a posterior probability on which I can use some threshold and, and, and obtain a decision boundary. And I can unravel the whole thing. And for every data point, I can find out on which side of the decision boundary it lay. Uh, 
and you will uh, i can actually uh, uh, plot the decision boundary simply by passing each training instance through my network and painting it as red or blue depending on how the uh, how the network uh, classified it so let's see what this actually does right uh, actually actually i'm going to paint the network with the color of the original class and look at the shape and that shape is the uh, and the sh and look at the shape of the boundary between the two classes and that shape is the decision boundary model by the network so let's see how this process process goes right uh, as we train this figure to the left top left shows you the mean squared error between the uh, actual output and the desired output here i'm using the msc as the loss and you can see what happens as the training progresses this input space is sort of rotated around and it's rotated around uh, such that the uh, when you apply the activations the space is rotated and walked by the tanh activations such that after you collapse these tanh activated or uh, uh, activated the tanh transformed features uh, from the hidden layer to the affine combination of the output layer the blue and the red end up on different sides of a nice clean threshold and as a result if i apply that threshold the actual decision boundary that you get in this particular example is this little figure to the right which is not quite a circle uh, this probably needed and needed more training but it actually begins to capture this uh, decision boundary that you really want but the interesting portion is that as you go from as the data goes through the first layer to the second layer the data which were not linearly separable become increasingly linearly separable right so now this is a synthetic example let's look at a more realistic example this is for cifar 10 and here the cifar 10 has been processed using a uh, uh, 12 layer neural network so there are 10 hidden 1 to 11 6 7 8 9 10 11 hidden layers and then finally a uh, a, a classification layer and so this one each i don't recall exactly how many neurons were in each layer uh, but uh, we've taken uh, the uh, representations basically the outputs of the activations of each layer and projected the, them down into two dimensions using pca now initially when you randomly initialize the network the outputs of the two, of the 11 layers look like this then observe what happens as i train the network as you train the network you find it eventually learns to behave in this manner as you go through the layers of the network the classes become increasingly linearly separable until by the time you get to the penultimate layer you can actually see where you can draw the decision boundaries to maximally separate the classes so the linear separability increases as you can see in fact they become linearly separable in this particular case by the time you hit the ninth layer now here i've projected it down to two dimensions and you can see again how the as the training progresses they become more separable let's actually look at a slightly better visualization into three dimensions and again see how this happens that as the training progresses the classes become linearly separable in fact each of the classes ends up in a different plane in this particular example and you can just draw uh, you know horizontal planes uh, uh, separating out each of the classes but again as you go through the layers the data which look horribly tangled in the beginning becoming become increasingly linearly separate, separated till eventually the representations learned by the penultimate layer are uh, well separated so uh, this sort of uh, shows that the uh, the uh, manifold hypothesis that uh, we that i just mentioned uh, is well, maybe it's uh, not proven true but it's definitely a very plausible hypothesis that as you go through the network each layer in the network makes the classes more separable until they are maximally linearly separable by the time they hit the uh, the final hidden layer just before the output and in fact when you're training any neural network visualizing the data as they go through the network 
and ensuring that behavior of this kind is actually observed is a pretty good uh, way of, of figuring out if the network is actually learning things properly. Uh, now, all of that was predicated on the case where the classes are linearly separable, right? But then the classes need not be linearly separable. And that's where we actually began. So I started off saying by saying, okay, what happens with classes that are not linear, that are not separable? And we saw the case that we saw that the logistic function captures the a posteriori probability of the classes. But then the, I mean, we only considered linearly separable classes. Then our next question was, what if the classes are not uh, are not separable and the boundaries, ideal boundaries are not even linear? And to answer that question, I made a simplification and first we consider the separable case. Now let's go back and look at the inseparable case. So in the inseparable case, you're going to have data of this kind, where the ideal function is still something like this double pentagon, but the actual data that you have provided look like this figure to the left, where you have some blue dots in the nominally red regions and some red dots in the nominally blue regions. So here, what would happen? Basically the same thing happens. So the lower portion of the network is going to start off on this data and keep trying to tease apart the classes until they are as linearly separable as possible by the time they hit the penultimate layer. And now, once you achieved a situation like the figure to the left, then the final neuron over here can actually learn the posterior probability of the classes based on these, on these almost linearly separable features. So basically what this tells us is that the feature extraction layer, even for inseparable classes, the feature extraction layer transforms the data such that the posterior probability may now be modeled by a logistic. And the output logistic simply computes the posterior probability of the classes given the input. Now there's something beautiful uh, that falls out of this, right? Uh, so th this, was a, this was, by the way, for a binary classification case. For a multi-class classification case, it's again going to be the same thing. This feature extraction layer is going to try to make the data as linearly separable as possible. And then the final logistic is going to compute the a estimate the a posteriori probabilities of the classes given the inputs. So, uh, so there's something very pretty in all of this. When we just did our neural network training so far, we just said, okay, let's define a loss, let's define a, uh, a divergence measure that, uh, that the divergence measure that uh, so sort of quantifies the error between what the network actually produces and what we want it to produce. And let's learn the parameters of the network to minimize this divergence. And then one of the many divergence functions that we chose was the, the callback Leibler divergence, which gives us the, uh, the cross entropy loss when the output is represented using a uh, one hot vector. But then in all of this, we didn't really pause to consider what is the underlying statistical uh, implication of the training we're performing. So here's what you're actually doing when you train the network. You're, if you train the network using the cross entropy loss, you are actually performing maximum likelihood estimation of the distributions of the classes or of the uh, a posteriori probability of the classes given the input. So you're actually doing a maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters of the network to maximize the joint likelihood of the data and their labels. But because the prior probability of the data doesn't really matter, you have you're effectively uh, doing a maximum likelihood estimate of p of y given x. So, uh, which is very pretty, right? Now, again, all of this, of course, has to be taken with a uh, pinch of salt uh, because neural networks, as we uh, know, are uh, immensely flexible. And so pretty much anything that I said over here uh, could be wrong in specific scenarios. I like to use this a little illustration by this, this book called Illusions by a guy by Richard Bach. Uh, 
which is about a guy by Messiah, about a Messiah who writes a book, and then the last page in the book says everything in this book may be wrong. So that holds you up, right? There's no such thing as they may, they, they may be no unless you have two data points at exactly the same point, which rarely ever happens in real life. There's no such thing as inseparable classes. And so there's nothing stopping you from learning really disgustingly ugly functions like the figure to the right, where you the network learns to isolate each point and assign the correct label to it. Now, is this really the classifier you want to learn? In most cases, not. But there may be situations where indeed this is really what you want, right? So the notion of correctness, as suggested, suggested by the intuitions we've seen so far, have uh, have their limitations. It's very problem specific, and also what you will actually learn is subject to uh, the architecture of your network and the various other restrictions you impose on it on learning, like regularization, the training paradigm, how much it's converged, and so on. Now. I'm going to change gears here, but before I change gears, I want to uh, mention something that uh, has has repeatedly uh, uh, come up on Piazza. I find a lot of conversations about uh, where uh, students, people claim that if you train too much, you're overfitting to the training data. Now, that's by itself, that's not a that, that's not a very useful, meaningful statement. It's actually wrong. When all you have are your training data and the architecture of your network, then the best thing you can do is to match the training data as best as you can. When you don't match your training data closely enough, without imposing additional restrictions, you have no way of knowing whether 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 where you end up. So is going to be closer to the test data or farther away from the test data compared to the compared to the best fit on the training data. So uh, given that you have no prior idea, you have no way of knowing whether they're going to end up closer or farther away from the test data, it's rather unwise to assume uh, that just because you don't train all the way to the end, you're going to end up closer to the test data. If that were indeed the case, then uh, you know there, there, there really wouldn't be any point in spending a lot of time training. So the uh, real way to think about it is that the, the, your uh, best guess for your test error is going to be your training error plus some function of the complexity of the network and the restrictions you impose. And typically when you reduce the complexity of your network and impose greater restrictions, your training error will, will increase. So the increase in training error is a correlation, not a causation, which means that what you that uh, the improved test error that you may get, which results from a reduction in the value of the function of complexity and restrictions, uh, just correlates with the corresponding increase in the training error. So don't use just just don't just use training error by itself as a measure of how well you fit the, te fit the test data. There are several Piazza posts on this, take a look. Anyway, moving on, right? So here's what we have seen. We've seen what the network learns at the output. And we've sort of learned what kinds of, what, what kinds of, uh, uh, what kinds of features the network learns at the penultimate layer. And we've seen, got developed some idea of what uh, the network actually does to the inputs as they pass through the network. But what exactly does each of these neurons capture, right? So to understand that, let's go back and look at the basic perceptron itself. So here is the basic perceptron as before. Now I'm going all the way back to class two to, for this particular illustration, remember the very simple perceptron, the, the, oh, as, as we originally defined it. In our original definition of the perceptron, the perceptron looked at a weighted combination of the inputs and compared it to a threshold. If this weighted combination exceeded the threshold, it fired, otherwise it didn't, right? If I were to write this in a, in a, in a vector format, I can write the inputs of the perceptron as a vector the weights as a vector, 
and you say the output of the positron is one if the inner products between the weights and the inputs is greater than the threshold and zero otherwise. So if you want to know how that perceptron is behaving, what you really want to do is to uh, see, look at the weights and try to extract information from the weights. What do these weights tell us, right? To understand that, let's go back and look at some geometry. First, I'm going to tell you something slightly outrageous that in high dimensional space, all vectors are more or less the same length. This is because uh, as you increase the dimensionality of the space for any given uh, given upper bound on the lengths of the uh, vectors, the majority of the volume of the space lies of the of a sphere very lies very close to the surface of the sphere. So, which means that if I if I if I have some uh, any kind of natural restriction on the length of my data, uh, de that by length I mean the Euclidean length L two pretty much all of the data are going to lie within some very small uh, fraction of e each other in terms of length, right? Just hold that thought. What this means is that you can think of all of your data as lying approximately on the surface of a sphere. Now, the perceptron's classification rule says that it will fire if the inner product between the inputs and the weights exceeds a threshold. Now we know from algebra that the inner product between two vectors, inner product between some x and any, any vector x and, and any vector w is simply the length of x times the length of w times cos theta, right? So when I say that the inner product is greater than t, let me assume uh, just for, uh, uh, for simplicity that the length of w is one, then this means that this inner product if, if this inner product is greater than t, it means that cos theta is greater than t divided by the length of x, right? So in other words, theta is going to be less than, because cos is monotonic between zero and pi over two. So this means that theta is going to be less than cos inverse of t over mod x, right? So, so in other words, again, this means that the neuron is going to fire if the angle between the input and the weights is less than some threshold. So every weight actually represents, so basically what, what this means is that the weights of the perceptron represent a canonical input that the neuron is looking for. And it has some tolerance by which the input can vary with respect to this canonical input. And it's going to fire if the input lies within the within a cone of this canonical input. So basically, the weights of the neuron look represent the ideal input that the neuron is looking for. So alternately stated, you can think of each perceptron, each neuron, as a correlation filter. It's going to fire if the correlation between the weights pattern and the input exceeds a threshold. So let's say you have a single perceptron which is working on this grid of values and you want it to fire if the input looks like the digit two, then you don't actually even have to compute the weights. All you have to do is to draw the figure two on this grid and set your weights according to this figure, zero for all of these guys, one for all the black regions. And then when any input comes in, the neuron is basically gonna compute the correlation between this input and the pat pattern of weights in this case, this correlation is 0.57, it's, it's low. So these two clearly don't look like one another, it won't fire. The correlation is basically the inner product of the two. If you have an input like this, now the correlation between this guy and this figure here is 0.82, which is quite high. And you know, as you can see, this looks a lot more like the figure two. So in this case, if your threshold is 0.8, for instance, the neuron would fire. So basically the perceptron, individual perceptrons are correlation filters and their patterns of weights represent the patterns that their weights represent the patterns that they expect from their input in order to fire. So suppose you're performing a more complex task, like <coughs> say uh, this one, where you build an MLP, which looks at figures like these. Those of you have, who have old digital watches or clocks, 
might have seen displays of this kind. It's basically just a collection of LEDs and you get different digits by, uh, by turning on different LEDs. So uh, if you wanted it to just, if you wanted to train an MLP to fire if uh, the input uh, represented a valid digit and not if it didn't, then basically what you would expect is that the lowermost neurons in the network are going to capture the significant features in the input. The, and so what I cap, mean by capture is that the weight patterns for these neurons are going to look like the features in the input. So for example, this one could be capturing this upper bar, this guy could be capturing this horizontal bar and so on. And then you would expect that the next layer looks for patterns in these guys. And so each of these neurons might, for instance, be capturing individual digits, and then the uppermost layer is just going to fire if any if it finds the appropriate patterns amongst these guys. In this case, if any of these fire, this would fire. This is the kind of buildup you would expect to see. It's not, this doesn't mean that this is exactly what you would see, but this is the kind of buildup of patterns that you would expect to see going from bottom to top. So obviously, for this to work, the low the feature detectors in the lowermost layer have to be sufficiently. Uh, you need to have a sufficient number of them. Uh, in order to capture all relevant features of the input. Now, one of this thing, one of this uh, outcomes of this is that you see that if these feature detectors, if they if they fire, if they uh, detect the appropriate patterns, you can compose all of the digits from the features they they uh, they detect. So what I mean by this is that if you look at these features, let's say I got the digit one then I would expect this guy to fire and this guy to fire. And I would expect these other guys not to fire, right? But then, wait, I'd expect this one, the second one and the fifth one to fire and that fifth, sorry. If I got the digit one, I'd expect the second and the third to fire. I'd expect the remaining ones not to fire, right? But then for the second one, you know that the pattern of weights look like, looks like this grid over here because this is what it's looking for. The third, for the third one, the pattern of weights looks like the grid over here because this is the pattern it's looking for. So now, if I went back and simply said, I'm going to add the weight patterns for these two guys up and recreate an input, you would expect that if the input one came in, basically uh, just adding these two weights, the weight patterns is going to recreate the digit one. Now, mathematically stated, or I, I could just be multiplying each of these outputs by their corresponding weights and adding them up. And because the weights represent patterns and because the outputs are going to be zero for patterns that were not seen and ones for patterns that were seen, you would expect that the reconstructed structure is going to look much like the input. So you're basically putting back all of the patterns that you detected in the input. So in other words, if I have some weights over here, and if these neurons fire, and then I come and then I combine them back using the transpose of this weights matrix, which is basically to say I'm, uh, I'm putting the weights, uh, weights patterns back together, you would sort of expect to reconstruct the input. So uh, will this really work? Will it reconstruct it, reconstruct everything? Not really. This network is optimized to recognize digits, so it'll only retain distinctly digit-like or non-digit-like features. The rest are irrelevant and, and will be lost. But you can try to make this explicit. You can sort of try to actually train this network to actually reconstruct the inputs and not be specific to digits. This is what we will call an autoencoder. And so uh, the autoencoder has got two parts. This is this encoder, which detects all the most significant patterns, and the decoder, which puts those patterns together back to reconstruct the input. The simplest autoencoder would just have a single hidden unit. Uh, and if you make it really simple, the single hidden unit would have a linear activation. It's going to look for some weight W and based on how much of the weight it sees, it's going to reconstruct the input by the weight scaled by the output of this, uh, of this, of this uh, unit. So what will this learn? Now, let's say I'm going to try to train this one guy by minimizing the error between the output and the input. Now, because both output and input are continuous valued variables, I'm not going to use the, the cross entropy loss. I will actually use the L2 divergence. Now, because the activation, I'm assuming that the activation is linear, 
the output of this neuron is simply going to be Wx. So the reconstruction is going to be the output of this neuron multiplied by W transpose. So the final output is W transpose Wx. The error is going to be X minus W transpose Wx. The square, squared norm of this difference is the, uh, is, is, the, is the divergence between the two. And this, I learned these Ws to minimize this divergence. And as you can see, this is simply just PCA. So if you actually look at this arithmetic, those of you have looked at, uh, who are familiar with PCA, which I assume is all of you, this is just simply principal component analysis. So what happens is that this autoencoder is going to find the direction of maximum energy. And if the inputs have zero mean, then it's going to find the direction of maximum variance. And it's going to, any input is going to be mapped on to a point on this principal axis which represents the direction of maximum variance. And now, once you have learned this from some input, if I throw away the initial portion of this input and just excite the, uh, just the output, the output basically captures only the direction of principal variance. It cannot reconstruct anything besides what's on this particular line. So regardless of what input I give it over here, the output is going to lie somewhere on this, curve, on the, on this straight line, right? So, this means that once I've trained this network, uh, I can provide any kind of input and the output is always going to lie on this line. And this will hold regardless of whether the output weights and the input weights are the same or even if they are, if they are different. Basically because this network is going to learn to recreate the X that has the lowest overall error with respect to this, this X hat, which has the lowest overall error with respect to X, uh, it's going to find the principal subspace because it's only data points on this principal subspace that have the lowest overall error with respect to the input. And so regardless of whether you make these two different or the same, this network is going to learn to put every data point somewhere on this principal subspace. Now, uh, that was just with one neuron, but if I increase it to many neurons, this two is just going to be PCA, right? Now, if I have many hidden neurons with, with, with linear activation, now I would have a weights matrix then instead of a just, just a weights vector, but this weights matrix, this weights matrix basically represents a principal subspace and every input is going to be placed somewhere on this, put somewhere on this principal subspace and the overall training would still learn the principal subspace. This two is going to be just PCA. Now, uh, just some terminology. I can decompose all of this into two, uh, this network into two parts. The lower half is what I will call the encoder, which finds the location on the principal subspace, and the decoder, which draws the point on that principal subspace. The encoder is the analysis which net, which computes the hidden representation. The decoder is the synthesis net, which reconstructs the data from the hidden representation, right? Now, we've seen what happens when you have linear activations. When the hidden layer has linear activations, the decoder is able to reconstruct a linear manifold and put the data on this linear manifold to best fit, to best, to look as similar as possible or to best match the input itself. But now if you include nonlinear activations, what happens? The decoder is now able to actually, because nonlinear activations curve the surface. And so the decoder basically put, learns, re plots the outputs on some on a curved manifold. And so when you train this network to minimize the error between x hat and x, what you're really fine doing is finding the principal nonlinear manifold on which the data lie. You're basically performing non-linear PCA. And once you've done this, the decoder portion of this network can now only produce data on this non-linear manifold. So, uh, so afterwards, if I excite the decoder with any kind of input, the data is are always going to lie on this non-linear manifold. And now you can think of the figures I showed earlier had just one simple layer, but in reality, your network is going to have many layers, right? 
and the deeper the network is and the more more the uh, number of neurons the more complicated the manifolds that it can actually uh, uh, learn and so uh, the more detailed the manifolds are that that, is, that this network can find uh, that 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 capture the structure of the data deeper networks capture more complicated manifolds so here are some examples in this case i've got two dimensional inputs and two dimensional outputs this is here i uh, trained this this network had uh, uh, each neuron the encoder and decoder have two layer, hidden layers of 100 neurons the, but the hidden layer has only one dimension so intuitively you'd expect the decoder to learn the spiral and the value that goes into the decoder to be something of some to be the position on the spiral which is computed by the input the encoder right and indeed if you look at what happens with the decoder and the output of the decoder you see that all of these inputs basically end up being mapped onto a spiral so uh, the issue over here the issue with this kind of network however is that it learns the structure of the training data very well but then when you try to go outside the training data bad things can happen so for instance if i feed once after training the network if i feed the decoder z these hidden values that were not seen uh, that were that were not seen for any training instance then the outputs can go to other places like here it draws this line or if i extend the z beyond the range of z values where z is the uh, the uh, representation at this point. If I extend the Z beyond the values seen on the input, you can end up getting this crazy curve, right? So here's another example. This one was trained on data which uh, lies somewhat on a sinus side. And once again, the uh, network learns that the data actually lie on this manifold. But then after having trained it, if I continue to excite the decoder with Z values, outside what was seen in the training data it doesn't continue the sinusoid it actually just draws straight lines from these ends so it learns the underlying manifold but doesn't actually generalize beyond the manifold yes what's the question yes i had a question so the does the decoder no matter almost the input as long as it's in the range of the training data it's going to decode and just put it along this line correct it's, Okay, so it's a little more complex than that, right? It's not just in the range. You see this, this, this line over here? So mm -hmm. these were Z values that were actually in the range of the training data, but not mm -hmm. actually seen in the training data. I see. Right, so you need, so the problem with the whole autoencoder business is that, and this uh, is that uh, it doesn't quite behave in the intuitive manner that you would expect to expect it to even on simple examples. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, when the hidden representation here is of lower dimensionality than the input, Yakshan, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So this uh, behavior of uh, going away from the manifold learned is it, it was that because of like uh, the middle layer had just one neur neuron in the case you showed, or is it a general phenomenon? That it's because control? there are no constraints, right? You have no way of saying, yeah, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Guys, I'm going to maybe go a few minutes over because I have some examples I'd like to play, but uh, the uh, issue is that uh, you have no constraints. So in fact, you are never going, uh, in the case of, of PCA, the nature of the function is known, so it's always going to lie in a linear manifold. Here you have no constraints on what kinds of functions this, this, this network can learn. And so because of that, it's a nature of the beast, right? There's nothing to do with this particular data or how many hidden representations we have. Okay. Okay. Still, you can actually use it to pretty good effect, right? And we'll see how. So basically, going back, if this hidden representation has much lower dimensionality than this guy, then this hidden representation is called a bottleneck and it somehow learns something of the manifold of the data. Although it's not perfect, it learns a manifold and we can assume that the decoder now is only going to be able to generate data on the specific manifold that it's learned from the training data, right? It may not have learned a perfect manifold. For example, it didn't learn a perfect sinusoid over here. 
if you continue the z values outside the training range, it's actually extending it linearly, right? But to some extent, it learns the underlying manifold. Now, this has a very nice side effect in that now, if I want to generate data that look like the training data, I can feed it other kinds of values over here. And it's going to only produce data on the manifold that it has learned. Again, with the caveat that those man that manifold may not have been perfectly learned and very often will not be, right? But like in all things neural network, if you do these things really carefully, here are the kinds of things that you can do. I can actually use this decoder as a source specific generative dictionary. I can now learn to produce other things that lie on that manifold. And this is exactly the kind of, uh, so for example, when you, you guys are encountering GANs and VAEs, we'll, we'll see this later in the class. What is happening in those problems is that the training process itself becomes very careful. Uh, it takes a much greater cognizance of the nature of the manifold that the decoder learns and learns to constrain it in a proper way so that it can produce typical data from the source. That's what you get in all of those beautiful examples that you see where you know, networks paint pictures and so on. All of this is based on the simple fact that if you have a structure of this kind and you learn it well, then this decoder over here can only produce data on the uh, on a specific manifold which might well, if properly trained, represent the actual manifold of the data itself. And so here's an example where we did manage to do this, you know, cleanly several years ago. So here we learned an autoencoder on a, uh, on musical instruments. So this one was learned on spectrograms of a saxophone. And then after having learned it, we threw away the encoder and then we just excited just one neuron in the decoder and set all of the other guys to zero. And when you excite it, here's the sound it produces. Tell me if you can hear it. Can you hear it? Yeah, so that sounds kind of like a saxophone. It's not a pure note, but it's something that could be produced by a saxophone. Uh, uh, this is what you get when you excite a different note. This also sounds like a saxophone. And we find that if you excite it with different combinations of inputs, it always produces saxophone-like noises. Uh, here's an example where we trained it on a clarinet. So again, the decoder has learned to only produce clarinet-like sounds, which is quite impressive, right? And you can put it to use on a very cute application. And we actually put it to use on a signal separation problem. Here's the problem. You're given mixed sounds from multiple sources and you want to separate out the sources. So there's something called a dictionary-based technique, which is a very simple idea. You learn a dictionary of building blocks for each sound, such that all signals from that source are composed by entries from the dictionary for the source. So for example, you could learn a dictionary for guitar, such that anytime you activate this dictionary, uh, it's going to produce guitar-like sounds. You could learn a similar dictionary for say drums, such that anytime you activate the dictionary, it's going to produce drum-like sounds. And now when you get a mixed recording, you put the dictionary for the guitar and the drum together and try to find out how to combine the entries from both dictionaries to best produce the sound that you just heard. Then you separate out the component that came from the, uh, from the uh, guitar dictionary and you separate out the sound, sound that came from the uh, drum dictionary and you expect that if you compose those things back together, you'll hear separated guitar and drum music. Now, this is a very general high level idea. So we applied the same concept here. We got some uh, examples of data for uh, different kinds of instruments. For each of them, we learned an autoencoder. And then you throw away the encoder portion. And the decoder basically becomes a constructive dictionary for that source. Anytime you excite the input, it's only going to produce outputs which look like that, which sound like that instrument, right? So now having learned using this, using this technique for learning, say a dictionary, neural dictionary now for say guitar and drums, let's say you get some mixed recording. Then you try to find out you how best to excite the dictionary for the guitar and how best to excite the dictionary for the drums 
such that when you sum their outputs, the output sounds like the test sound, right? You just basically minimize this uh, L2 divergence. And again, this is just using backprop, except in, in standard backprop, you would be updating the parameters of the net. Here, you're not doing that. You're propagating the, the error all the way back to the input and learning the inputs to these two dictionaries, right? These dictionaries are basically just the decoders of the autoencoder for one source and the auto dec decoder for the autoencoder for the second source. And then once you do that, so here's the overall process. Given the mixed signal and the source dictionaries, you want to find these excitations that best compose this mixed signal. And you can, you, you can do that using backpropagation. And then once you do, and then the outputs of these individual dictionaries are, can be assumed to be lying on the manifold. Uh, uh, so the output of this first dictionary can be assumed to be lying on the manifold that this guy captures, which would represent the, uh, which, would, which, could, which is likely to be uh, the type of sound that this dictionary was learned on. And the same thing for this guy, right? So here is uh, the, uh, in closing, here's the example that we got. We did this with a couple of musical instruments. This is the It's got two uh, instruments, uh, uh, two wind instruments. I know, I think it's one is a violin and I'm not really sure, I'll have to look it up. But then for each of those guys, we learned a, a autoencoder where the decoder had five layers and was 600 units wide. So it's a pretty, uh, small neural dictionary, right? And then we use this approach here to try to separate out the components. So here's the mix sound. Here's the first separated sound. The next. And as you can see, the decoders have to actually learn the right manifold, and you get a pretty good separation, right? So, anyway, so just in conclusion. Uh, what the story for today, what we've seen is that uh, we've sort of looked at what networks learn in their intermediate uh, values. What do those intermediate values actually represent? We've learned that classification networks learn to predict a posteriori probabilities for classes, that the network until the final layer is a feature extractor that converts the input data to be almost linearly separable. The final layer is a classifier or predictor that operates on linearly separable data. And that new neural networks, we can actually sort of capture this, actually exploit this uh, characteristic of uh, learning underlying data manifolds and straightening them out to learn uh, to perform linear or nonlinear PCA, basically what we call autoencoders, and that these can be used to compose constructive dictionaries for data which can in turn be used to model data distributions. So I'll stop right here. Uh, I sort of run three minutes over, you'll have to bear with me, uh, but this seems to have worked. So uh, maybe we'll also have the next class online. Uh, I'll wait here for questions, but those of you who want to leave can leave. Questions? Yakshan? Uh, so uh, you said that these autoencoders can learn the training data uh, distribution nicely. Can it also then use to generate more training data from so the, what it learned? That's basically what has happened over here, right? So I learned that so in this case, the test data are uh, base, are uh, and have not been seen during training. Now, the problem is that they can't, if you do it naively, as we saw, the manifold it learns can actually be kind of not, it can, it can, it can go off into bad places for, for uh, in uh, regions where there was no training data. So you have to be very careful in how you learn this.
and that's what we that's what basically uh, is done. You know, more careful training of this manifold is what is done in VAEs and GANs. Uh, VAEs, you say? VAEs and GANs. Okay. Right. So, uh, right. There was uh, somebody else who raised their hand. Which was that? There was a second hand raised. Any more questions? All right, guys. So I'll stop here. If you have any further questions, post on Piazza, okay? And thanks for your patience. Thanks for coming to class.